today than he has been 66. I am so impressed. And still, the teachers are all from Singapore. And you know, a good number of Chinese, they come and take this yoga practices. And some of them have become teachers also. When I went to Malaysia, we went to a small restaurant to just have a cup of tea. And the girl who was serving us, she came and said Namaste. So I was surprised. I said Namaste. Then I asked, have you seen us anywhere? I said, yes. I was in Singapore and I took yoga training in your Sarada Hall. She said, I was so happy, you know. So this yoga has been very popular. And every week, Sunday morning hours, we conduct the yoga lessons here. But every time at the start of the course, we have to return 50 to 60 people for lack of space. Then we decided to have on another day also, so that we can include more people. So nowadays, from 7 to 9, on every Friday also, we have the same yoga classes. So, because of the celebration, the yoga teachers came and then they decorated so beautifully. And the picture here you find next to Mother Gayatri, because there is a opening prayer. The yoga people start with Gayatri Mantra. So Gayatri Mother's photo they have, and Nikam Guruji's photo also they keep. As a great homage to the great Hatha Yogi, who has brought health awareness to Singapore. And our Atul Deshpande, who is in charge of this yoga kuti, he has been awarded as a health ambassador of Singapore, twice. So such a great tradition we have on yoga. So if you are not learned the basic Hatha Yoga, at least to become steady in your, in your sitting, I think you must join. It's the only 12 week class and they teach you very personal attention is paid to each student, whatever be the age, from 12 onwards they take. And even I have seen elderly people coming and learning yoga. Not only for keeping your body fit, but also in order to remove certain diseases, systemic diseases in the body, the yoga is a great help. So with these few words, let us go back to our Bhagavad Gita, which is a yoga shastra. You know, that's how our, the great Vyasa says, at the end of every chapter, he has got one sentence. Iti Bhagavad Gita Su Upanishad Su Brahma Vidyayam Yoga Shastri. This Gita is a Yoga Shastra. So, what is yoga we mean? Generally, we mean this Hatha Yoga as yoga. And nowadays, it has become very popular all over the world. Wherever I go, I see some yoga studio is there. And some Western lady or the other the countries, people, they teach yoga. They go to India and learn yoga and come back and then teach. So like that, plenty of yoga. In Singapore itself, I have heard that there are many yoga studios who teach yoga, of course, for payment. Hourly basis, you have to make payment. But here in Ramakrishna Mission, it is absolutely free. Apart from that, this Hatha Yoga slowly, slowly leads you to a higher planes of yoga. So yoga does not mean merely Hatha Yoga. The yoga has got other dimensions. But then, as a basic, if you want to learn or go to other dimensions, if you want to go to a primary school, then you must go to the kindergarten. So this is a kindergarten. Kind Hatha Yoga is a kindergarten. Once you master A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, etc., then you are fit to go to a yeah, primary school. Likewise, this Hatha Yoga is a basic. And that gives you the steadiness of physical body. And there is another dimension of yoga which creates, which teaches us steadiness of the mind. And that is why 
Sri Krishna is discussing in the second chapter where we are now. Just to recapitulate, I don't know whether you all have forgotten the whole subject. It was nearly a month we did meet. But then just to recapitulate briefly, it was Arjuna's unwillingness to wage a war. And he brought out several reasons to Lord Krishna that I will not fight. So he said many reasons that it is a sin to kill my own Kirtan kin. And by killing the soldiers here who have got nothing to do with our problem, what is their problem? A kingdom was not given to them by Duryodhana. Actually, this Panchapandava are entitled for a kingdom, but Duryodhana didn't. That is their personal problem. But due to which, if the war is done, millions of soldiers will lose their life. That means millions of women who will become widows. Millions of children will become orphans. Just because for my property, I am raising a war and making the people suffer, is it proper for me to wage a war? Like that, he gave other also other many reasons. Sociologic reasons he gave that there will be a Varna Shankara if the, all the people are dead and whoever remaining there, they will happen to intermix without any discrimination by which the society standard, the culture will go down. Not only that, this life is this like this, but what about the parallel life? That is the next life. The next life, I will go to hell. So, O oh Krishna, I am fearful of all these terrible consequences, so I shall not fight. And that is how he finishes the first chapter. In the second chapter, again he says to Krishna, Look, it seems you are not at all convinced of all my arguments. Now he puts a new argument in the second chapter openly. What he says? He says to Krishna that if I have to fight this war, I have to fight with my own gurus who are standing here. Who are the gurus? Dronacharya, Kripacharya. And then my own grandsire, Vishnu Pitama, he is standing there. And I have to kill all these people. What a terrible hell is waiting for me. So Krishna, I shall not kill. When he was talking this argument, he started having shaking, the limbs started shaking. His mouth became parched and the words were not coming out. And from this hand, the Gandhiva, that wonderful bow given by Lord Mahadeva, that fell down on the ground. And he sat down, utterly exhausted. It's got despondency. And that is the time when Krishna saw the emergency situation. You know, when you go to a doctor and if it is a normal disease that you have and it can be taken at, at a particular pace, then he will give injection, he will give you medicines, etc. He will tell you what to eat, what not to eat. So it will go for 10 days, 15 days, then you get cured. But when an emergency situation comes, a patient is brought to emergency, you cannot do all those things. You have to set aside all the regular rules and regulations and give him a, in a strong injection by which he is revived. Otherwise, he will go into coma. That was the situation of Arjuna. So, Krishna gives that type of a dose. And what dose he gives? Even Arjuna could not stand that dose. Even we reading that, we are stunned. How oh, Krishna is talking to Arjuna like this? Klaipya mas gavam pata Neitat vayu papadvete Chudram hridaya dharvaryam Ekto tishta parantapar And he addresses him, parantapar Hey Arjuna, you are the scorcher of foes All the enemies fear of you And today, you are like this? Klaipya, he says You have encountered the Klevata, you know the Klevata is the worst. If you had told him, you behave like a woman, at least that he says for something. Because he was a great warrior, 
and uh, Arjuna had a great ego of his battleship, this power to do battle. And that person, if you call him a woman, he will get upset. Not only woman, he uses the word, that word he is not used, he says Clypeum. When that word was used, that was a terrible shock. Arjuna gets and Arjuna recovers from the shock. And then Sri Krishna starts giving reasons why he should fight this battle. So many reasons we saw in the second chapter, that is what we are now in. In the second chapter beginning, Krishna gives him a lot of reasons. One of the reasons that you all remember is that you will not incur sin by waging this war. Because this war was not sought after by you. How this war has been imposed upon you. You remember the story in Mahabharata where Yudhishthira tells Sri Krishna, I don't want this war. But then the kingdom has to be taken back. How do you take away your kingdom? So they all have a meeting. But then Bhima has already announced in the Bhari Sabha, when everybody is sitting there in that assembly, he has already announced long back, 12 years back, that I shall thrash the thigh of Duryodhana and drink the blood. And Draupadi, she has also sworn that yes, I shall not tie my head unless Duryodhana is killed. Now all these things, and Arjuna, Arjuna has tremendous anger on this Duryodhana, and he wants to take away the life of Karna. Other than Karna, there is nobody who can stand in the battle against Arjuna. So he knows if Karna is there, then I will get defeat. He was little afraid, fear of Karna was there. So he's, he told Draupadi, don't worry, I shall see that Karna is eliminated. And with all the promises, still the Pandavas did not want the war. So when they consulted to consulted Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna said, okay, I will go as a representative of yours to Duryodhana's palace and speak to Dhritarashtra. Who is the king now? Let me go there. So he went. All the day, Sri Krishna made a trip to Hastinapura and he was well received by Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra had the inkling that Krishna is not an ordinary king. He was God. That he had an inkling, though he did not have the full knowledge. And then in the Sabha, Krishna says, give the half of the kingdom at least. But Duryodhana came up and he said, no sir, we shall not then Krishna says, give five villages. Duryodhana refuses. Then he says, give that much space that are formed on the five pins. You, know, you take that all pin and you see what is the space is there in that pin. So five pin space you give. Duryodhana said, nothing to him. They have to face me in a war. And in the war, let them defeat me and take the whole kingdom. But so long I am alive, I shall not part with an inch of my land. Now Krishna's mission is a failure. God, an avatar of Purusha, coming for a particular purpose. Paritranaya sadhuna vinasha reche dushkrita. For that purpose he comes. And if Duryodhana had accepted, say, half the kingdom and given it, the war would not have happened. Then the Dushkritis, what will happen to the Dushkritis? They would have stayed on. They would not, they would not have been destroyed. And neither the Dharma would have been installed. So that was the reason, perhaps, by the will of the Lord, Lord's efforts met with failure and he came back and told the Pandavas, no, they want only God. So Krishna says to Arjuna, 
The war was not sought by you, it was imposed upon you. Why you should talk like that? And secondly, you do not know the result of the war. It has not yet begun. Who is going to win, nobody knows. Already you are thinking you are going to win and you are going to kill all the people. That is foolishness. Then he says, as a Kshatriya, you have got a particular responsibility in this society. So if that society's responsibility, by going away from here, as Arjuna says, I would like to be a mendicant, begging with a begging bowl, going to the different houses and begging my food and living, that is better than killing my own brothers, he says. That type of Arjuna he says, as a your own not your duty. As a Tatriya, you have to defend yourself. And you want to run away from this battle. So, he says, a man who does not have a focus, who does not have one-pointedness, he cannot accomplish anything. So, if you want to do win this war, you must be one-pointed, you must be focused. And the moment you engage in this war as a Kshatriya, all the due punya accrue to you. Even if these people die in this war, no sin will accrue to you because you are doing your duty. That is a very strong message uh, Krishna gives at the end. That uh, you have to do it, perform your duty. That means you will not incur any sin. With this, Arjuna is silent. He becomes calm. And then Arjuna asks a question to Krishna. You say the mind must be mind must be calm, quiet, and it must have equanimity. I understand all these things, but what are the signs of a person who has got equanimity? Is there anybody that we can see in this world? All those things we discussed earlier. This is called sthita prajna. A person who has got a steady wisdom is called sthita prajna. Sthita means steady. Prajna means wisdom. So a man who has got a wisdom which is steady, that is a wisdom that doesn't come today and go away next month. It has got a steadily, the wisdom is possessed by a man. What is, what are the signs of that person? How does he walk? How does he sit? How does he talk? When he asks these questions, and that is what Krishna is playing, and that is what we have been seeing. So what Sri Krishna said from 54 onwards, so we found that he was explaining that a person who can be called a yogi must have a steady wisdom. And that yogi, he must be keeping his senses under constant subjugation. That means the senses must be under his control. What is the example he gives? He gives the example of tortoise. A tortoise is there. If you go to Makriji, Sizzarwa, you can see that tortoise. They come sometime and stand there. So I once when I went there, I saw it. So big one, I looked at it. And like a stone it was there. And slowly it got out its limbs, four feet outside and start up moving. So when it doesn't move, or when it senses any type of danger from outside, it withdraws its limbs. The face is going, gone inside, the feet is inside, and the shell is covered. So nobody can harm. And a yogi is like that. So a yogi withdraws his senses when he realizes that there is an the imminent danger. Then Krishna says, merely withdrawal of senses is not enough. Because one can withdraw his sense organs from contact with the sense objects, but then mentally he may be enjoying. That also can happen. You may be secluded, you may be in a cave, what of that? But you can close your eyes and certain sense objects that you have already enjoyed, you may be thinking of that in your mind. Even that should not be there. And him he calls a yogi. That type of yogi 
is not affected by the pain and pleasure, by the sufferings and the enjoyment and all types of dualities. He is not affected. So in tranquility, when he attains the tranquility, what was the, what is the result? That is what he said. 64 and 65. This is all last time. What is this? These two verses, what do they say? Ragan Dvesha Vyuktaistu Vishayam Indriyasharan Atma Vashay Videy Atma Prasadam Adhigachati Prasade Sarva Dukhana Ani Rasyopa Jayate Prasanna Chetaso Yashu Buddhi Parivala Tishtati Krishna says, but the disciplined yogi moving among objects with the senses under control and free from attraction and aversion gains in tranquility. Tranquility is called prasadam. We say prasad. When you come to temple, have some prasad, we say. What is the prasad? Prasad is nothing but an offering done to love. When you do puja, you know how to do an offering. So when the offering is done and you have the conviction that I have offered this speech to the Lord and the Lord has accepted it. So he has eaten it. So now this has become prasad. Why it is called prasad? Because anything that is offered to God and accepted by God, that is, that particular food item is now it called a sacramental food. It is sacred. So the sacred food, when you take it, it gives you the mental tranquility. It brings you new to prasadam. That's why if you go to any temple, you must ask for prasad. Is there any prasad here? And they give whether it is tirtam, whether it is uh, water, or it is any eatable prasad that they give. You must take it, and little you take, that's something. That, while eating it, you must say, ah, oh, this is Hanuman prasad, this is Lord Buddha's prasad, this is Vishnu's prasad. Like that, you must feel that. When you take that it is prasad, then what happens? Then your mind gets peace. The tranquility also comes in. And all the distractions of the mind become quieted down. So the prasadam adhigachati, he reaches the state of tranquility. But if you receive tranquility, what is the result? Is there anything more to attain? Then he says, prasade, in tranquility, sarva dukha na hanihi. He says, sarva dukha, all types of sufferings come to an end. What are the types of dukkha? We all know that. The dukkha of the mind is three types. And which is, when I say mind, the physics also is included. Whatever type of suffering you have, there are three types of sufferings. It is given in our scriptures. So one is Adi Bhotika. Another is Adi Devika. Third is Adhyatmika. So there are three types of sufferings that we get. Every Jivatma is coming into contact with these three types of sufferings. We have discussed earlier the details of these three types of suffering. And that is why we always say, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om Shanti, the first Shanti refers to Adi Bhauti suffering. Second Shanti refers to Adi Devika sufferings. Third Shanti refers to Adhyatmika sufferings. So these type of three sufferings are there. And all these three sufferings have to be put an end. Whether it is containing to, it is referring to physical, body or mind. So when these three have to be silenced, that's why you always say three times Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And that Shanti, in the tranquility, only Shanti will come. So he says, all the sorrows are destroyed for the intellect of the tranquil minded, Prasanna Chetasar, Ashu, Buddhi, this Buddhi, the intellect of the person, of the tranquil minded person, where it is, it is Pari Avatishtate, Parivatishtate, he says, where it is. 
it is that type of it is it becomes steady it doesn't waver parivar chetra means non wavering it is fully entrenched that type of mind yes yogi gets then abhi saw that how sri ram krishna used the sense organs for transcending the ordinary types of sense experience what he did whenever he used to see a beautiful scenery say black clouds are gathered in the sky and when he saw the black clouds and suddenly he saw a flight of cranes they are moving and the background is black and the white cranes are moving together and down below the green fields immediately he went into samadhi because the mere vision the vision is one of the sense organ we have got eyes it's got a sense organ and it comes into contact with the sense object that is called scenery so our eyes would like to always see good things nice things beautiful things if you put any ugly thing before you you would not like it is very badly kept the hall you would not like to come and sit here so i have to keep it neat and clean and singapore is best known all over the world how speak and span it is there so recently in boston when i was speaking about singapore i told them our country is so speak and span everywhere because if it, that is there then you would that is a good for eyes you see and you see everything is kept neat and clean so that sense objects must be properly kept so we find a bliss we get a happiness in that so likewise in every situation all the five organs we go through but our experience is different and ram krishna's experience was different he also used all his five sense organs but through every sense organs he went into a transcending limit and not in the ordinary type of sense enjoyment he had we have a nice thing when you see you have sense enjoyment our eyes have sense enjoyment likewise if a nice music is given our ears get sense enjoyment likewise beautiful fragrant flowers are given then our nose gets sense enjoyment likewise eating tasty food is given to us we enjoy it that is the sense of joy and the touch if you have a pet dog how you nicely do that pet dog and touch it and you get the sense of joy so all the five senses we use but what we get we get sense of joy but we are not trying to go beyond the sense of joy there is a joy in all these five sense organs coming into the sense respective objects okay enjoyment is that bliss a bliss that is a fraction of the bliss is there one man's bliss a human bliss chaitanya upanishad speaks about a measurement of this bliss very beautiful it says a man who is married has got a bliss has got ananda that bliss is nothing compared to that you go to 100 times you expand it that ananda of a human being of one devata one devata's bliss is so much it is nothing so compare it to 100 times more than that like that it goes on and on say and then finally it says that atma when you are in yourself that self bliss that atma ananda atmananda when that comes that is a portion of this infinite and from that infinite bliss a fraction a very minute just a fraction is given in the sense objects just imagine how we are so satisfied with the sense objects with the minute just type of bliss forgetting there is an infinite bliss waiting for us we have got or we don't want to realize that how pathetic our life is so that infinite bliss that is what sri ram krishna's mind immediately saw into all these five senses if you see the five senses swami chidananda ji whose book we are following beautifully gives five examples 
of the five senses of Sri Ramakrishna. How each sense organ coming into contact with the sense object transfers or transcends his mind to a higher level. As a first example, I said the vision. I told you eyes. Second is this touch. When Gadadhar was given or asked to, to don the Shiva's part in a drama, so when he was decorated like a jata and everything was kept on him and his whole body was smeared with the ashes. Ashes are very holy on Lord Shiva. You know that. How holy it is. Once Lord Dhruvasa wanted to meet this Lord of Death, Yama. So he went to Yama Dharmaraj. He's called Dharmaraj because he doesn't do anything but illogical or illegal. He's always established in Dharma. No work of Yama is considered as a Dharma. So it's called Dharmaraj, Kingdom. And that Dharma he went to meet him. And Dharmaraj welcomed him and he gave him a guest house to stay here. Okay, he stayed there. Suddenly, when Duvasa was walking towards his guest house, and he was walking, and Duvasa was also smeared with full of ashes. And he was walking, and Duvasa walking means it's a very majestic walk. And he was thumb, 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 like that is walking, and he's gone into his place of residence. After half an hour, one news came to Yama. Some messengers came from one hell. They say that, oh Lord, something has happened in our hell. Said, what has happened? All the, in all the sinners who have been tormented in this hell have become so happy. Nobody is lamenting, nobody is shouting, nobody is crying. And they are all feeling joy and joy and joy. Then Yama said, then have you stopped punishing them? He said, no. Hot, hot oil is there. I am putting, throwing that fellow into that oil bucket. But he is smiling. And he says, it is like a cold water. We don't understand. Something is wrong somewhere. So Yama went there. And he saw, really, it was not a Naraka, it was not a hell, it has become like a heaven. And all the people there, the sinners of heaven. And he couldn't understand. What is this? It is very strange. Then he thought, oh, this, our Dhuva Samuni is there. Let me go to him, because he is a great Trishi. He knows everything. Let me go and ask him, what is the secret of a hell being converted into a heaven now? So he went there. And then Durvasa was in deep meditation on Lord Shiva. So he waited and he came back from the meditation. He said, Oh Yama, you have come here. You should have asked me. I would have gone to your sabha and met you. He said, No, sir. I am in a great soup because the Naraka is meant for sinner's punishment. And that is not being done. It has become a hell. It has become a heaven. What is the secret of that? Durvasa smiled. Don't you know? When you asked me to go to my restroom, I was passing over that hell when I was walking on the sky. The vibhuti that I was having fell down on that hell and that became heaven. That is the spirit of vibhuti. You know, if, you, if you have that basma dharana, we call it the basma dharana. All the monks you will find if you go to North India, you will see the monks wearing. Basma always. So, this Basma Dharana is one of the important uh, ritual of a religious person who must feel that. So, one day somebody asked me, so I put a small Basma, not a big three, three lines I don't put here, but uh, because there are all very elite people here in Singapore. So, I thought, let me not put on and make a show here. So, small piece I put it. And then one fellow asked me, why are you putting this Basma? What does it mean? I told him, look, I'm not for me, I'm putting, I'm putting for you only. He said, for me? Yes. What is Basma? It's a burnt ashes. Whatever is burnt, that becomes ashes. 
So this, by seeing the ashes, you must realize that this body is not a term permanent. It is temporary. One day it will be also burnt. You realize that. For you only I am putting in this ashes. So of course you went away. Yes, whenever you take this basma in your hand and put it dharan, when you take it on your hand, then you must that's why in our temple we offer basma to Lord Shiva and then we keep it as a prasad outside. When you come out from the temple, you will see outside. We have got a tirtam is there and basma also is there. So many people while coming out, they put it. Actually, when they entering, you should put it and sit, you know. But many people are coming out, they put it. So, whatever it is, this Basma, when it was smeared on the body of Gadada, he lost consciousness. He entered into the super conscious level. And his Samadhi, that is small boy, Samadhi is continued for three nights, Sardhanaji nights. When he had this Basma featured on him, he was taken to the stage. And you are supposed to tell those lines of Lord Shiva. He could not speak. So the speech was not that. So watch out, watch out. That uh, if speech cannot, it cannot come back from that level. So it is gone. And he was completely much. It's a main touch of the sense object that was found. In Ram Krishna's life. Then what are the other three senses left? Other three senses are left. His hearing, his ears. We also hear nice music and we enjoy. But when Sri Ramakrishna used to hear Hari's name, the, the people who come, the Hari Sabha people used to come and they would bring that dollar and then by playing the dollar they would be singing Hari Nam, that's all. Sitting there in his, in his cot, he would get up and start joining them in dancing. And while dancing, he forgets his body. Only hearing the name of the Lord. The very first meeting of Yam in Sri Ramakrishna's room, when he enters and he looks at Sri Ramakrishna, Yam was stunned. That was the first meeting. He actually had an inclination to commit suicide. And he went. Some of his friends, Sidhu, brought him to the Shinesa, And he took him to Ram Krishna's room and Ram Krishna's doors were open and he looked, some people were sitting there and Ram Krishna was talking. What he was talking? The very first teaching, Yama writes in the gospel, was this that, see Ram Krishna is telling to the devotees, the moment you pronounce to Hari now the name of the Lord, if your hair stands on end, and if water comes out from your eyes, then no type of ritual is necessary for you. That is what he was doing. Hearing the name of the Lord, does it bring you tears? Some devotees come and ask me, Maharaj, I went to the shrine and I was sitting. I could not control my tears. Tears are flowing. However much I am removing, I am drying up. Tears are coming. Is it bad or good? I say it's very good. It's very rare experience to get tears when you stand before the God. And when you are thinking of Sri Ramakrishna in the temple and you are in awe before him and say, Oh, your Guru Maharaj is here. He is not an image. This image is a light personality. And this, he stands sitting there. And so blissful. And seeing that, you start shedding tears. It's a very good thing. If you have that experience, don't control the tears. Rather, allow the tears to flow. Let the tears flow. As much as you are having, you experience the joy of that. But you know, this is called tears of joy. Sri Ramakrishna makes a difference between tears of joy and tears of sorrow. He said there are two types of tears. So one must be able to discriminate. When tears of joy comes, allow the tears to come. So you go to another level. It's not a mere sense enjoyment. You go beyond the sensual enjoyment level to a super sensual enjoyment. And that is what Sri Ramakrishna had when he used to hear the name of God. Then 
He used to take the Agarbati in the evening. And he would take his Agarbati and give you a very good, say, Mogra Agarbati. If you have a Mogra Agarbati anytime you feel used, you know what a fragrance it is. Or any other flowers, jasmine. And any other flower, so fragrant. And the fragrant you would say, hey Krishna, hey Madhava, hey Govinda, hey Achuta. Like in the evening, he would go on showing his fragrance and put the Agarbati and he would close his eyes, gone into some. Arthabhahya Dasham, that is what M writes in the Gospel. See, Ramakrishna is known in Arthabhahya. That means half closed eyes, half mind is there and half mind has gone already above the sensual level. Only the fragrance. And when we get the fragrance, we say, ah, oh, what a beautiful fragrance. Like that, we take two, three times by our nose. One time taking itself is enough for Ramakrishna to go to super sensory spirits. And then the taste, sacramental food, prasad. The moment prasad comes to him, the Kali temple is to bring a plate of prasad to him. And he would just touch it on his head, merely touching. He has not even eaten. He has only seen that was enough for him. It has satisfied him. Prasad, eh, sarva dukkha nam. So this, in tranquility, all the sorrow is destroyed because it is anchored in. Where is this buddhi? The buddhi is anchored in. It is anchored in prasadam, in peace. Now, what's the time? Okay. I will, before I go to the next verse, and today I stop here. Uh, I want to introduce our guest Swami. Welcome to Swami Isha Dhyana Nanda. A person who gets bliss Ananda by Dhyana, by meditating on Isha, on Isha. So the Isha Dhyana Nanda, as Swami is here, he is, he was in Bedouin for many years. And after that, he was transferred to Jamshedpur, very nearest town, Ranchi, where I was there for 20 years. So, I was so happy to see him once more. From Jamshedpur, he has come to Singapore on his way to Sacramento in USA. He is now posted as assistant minister in Sacramento. So, I thought, uh, he, he was telling me that he would not take class or attest anything. So, but then I wanted him to say a few words, just two, three minutes. Let him speak to you. Please come. Here. I get the chat. Swami Devakshanandaji Maharaj for giving me the opportunity to speak a few words to you. Two days back, two days ago, he was asking me, since you are here, you can take the Gita class. I said, Maharaj, I am not used to speaking, public speaking, so uh, devotees will be frustrated if I give a class now. But I promise you, Maharaj, when I will come next, I will surely obey you. So, I'm, I like, I was, I'm feeling very happy to be here, seeing everything, uh, the shrine, the dedicated devotees, the uh, excellent city of Singapore, and especially love and affection of Sainte Dimashanadji and other monks. So, I, 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 I have come here for four days. When I was coming, everybody else in Belmont was telling, why are you staying in Singapore for four days? This is too, too much. Uh, it is a wrong decision to uh, stay in Singapore for four days. So after coming here, I, I am thinking, yes, it was a wrong decision to stay here for four days. I should have come for 10 days or 15 days. <laughs> so next time I will come for many days, and I will definitely will like to talk to you. And I thank you all once more, especially Swami Devakshan Maharaj, 
by showing love and affection to me. Thank you.